Thank you for being here. I acknowledge that the city of Hamilton, where I record this podcast, is situated upon the traditional First Nations territories of the Erie, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas, and the Chonodon of the so-called Neutral Tribes. Hamilton is also directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. It was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. Hamilton is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and this land acknowledgement is a small gesture to recognize the rich history of this land, and so that I can better understand my role as a settler, as well as a neighbor, partner, and caretaker. I stand in solidarity with all those that fight for justice on behalf of the murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, LGBTQ+, and two-spirited people. I grieve the generational trauma created by the residential school system and the 60s scoop. I grieve the children and childhoods lost through ignorance and racism. Miigwech. Thank you. Welcome to the arena, where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. I have known Nadine Kelly for almost a year, we met through the Akimbo workshops, or as Nadine effectually calls it, Akimbo Land. It's where we both started our podcasts, and we now coach. Being connected to that community has helped us keep sane through the months of lockdowns, and her generosity and friendship has meant the world to me. I'm so happy to share this episode with you. Thank you for listening. This is episode 39. You and I have both done the whole, I did this career and now I'm going to not do that anymore because that way madness lies. Trying to wrap my head around, if I had met you 12, 13 years ago, who would that woman have been and would I have been able to approach her in the same way? No? (laughs) No. She, no. uh, This person is almost, well, she was being repressed. I was so miserable, I was angry, I was resentful, and I didn't want to be in my body, and I didn't want to be in my life. I mean, I never excitedly talked about a day at work. It was like, oh, thank God, I survived another day. Fuck, I have to go back in tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then my first thought in the morning towards the end of that time I would wake up and the first thing I would think, with no exaggeration, was, oh no, I'm awake. Yeah, I have a little recognition of that. Hmm. So I have put together my typical intro. So we'll walk our way through that and see what comes out the other side. Sounds good. Nadine Kelly, you're a sister daughter, mother, and retired doctor. You were a specialist in pathology. You entered medicine with a deep desire to help people. But after 10 years of studying, you found yourself in a medical meat grinder where you stayed for another 10 years. It was making you sick and incredibly unhappy. The thing you most wanted was not possible to achieve where you were you took the hard decision to retire. And then you began to explore yoga as a release and a means of healing yourself. You took that deep-seated desire to help people and began to study to become a yoga teacher. You now specialize in working with women who are 50 plus, as well as women who are recovering from cancer, surgery, or other ailments. These are your wise women, as you call them, and you bring a holistic as well as a science-based approach to your work. You've created the Yogi MD podcast, where you're the creator and host. You're also a black belt in Taekwondo, a drummer, and a coach for several Akimbo workshops. Plus, you're writing your first book. (laughs) (laughs) It's such a pleasure to welcome you to the arena, Nadine. (laughs) I am so honored, Linda. Thank you for having me. 
I, I'm sorry, I, I laugh because it's just like, and then I'm doing this and I'm doing these <laughs> things over here. And I, I can relate to the desire to spread your wings and mm-hmm. test and try and just see what's coming back at you and what you're learning from all of those experiences, which are, are holistic in their own right. It's the creativity in writing, the podcasting, being a drummer, you know, being a musician, embracing that part of yourself, but also the physical from the taekwondo and and the drumming. I mean, it's such a physical instrument. It's so mm-hmm. fascinating. And then obviously the yoga and and what you're doing with the yoga and your approach to it and many, many layers of spirituality and mental growth. Anyway, I just think you're such a remarkable person on so many levels. And listening to the many conversations that you've had on on different podcasts and having had the opportunity to chat with you outside of the context of the Akimbo community has been really enriching for me. So thank you. Thank you. That's such a generous, such a kind introduction. I'm, I'm very humbled. You're most welcome. You've told this story many times. But let's start, first of all, with what was dinner conversation like in your household? So I'm first generation American. My parents, who were Haitian immigrants, they are high school educated. They came to the U.S. in the late 60s. They were working in factories and they had very different schedules. And I'm really not sure why we never did this, but we didn't have dinner together. Dinner together was just on special occasions, holidays, birthdays, but every day? No. My grandmother lived with us, my maternal grandmother, and so she would have dinner waiting. Mm -hmm. She would make Haitian food from scratch. And so by the time my sister and I arrived from school, that was the food that was waiting. What is Haitian food? Like, describe to me what that would mean. So Haitian food is essentially, it's a type of Caribbean fare where we eat rice and plantains and beans and either grilled or oven baked or basted, braised meats, proteins. We would have some um, roasted or stewed vegetables on the side sometimes. And it doesn't have to be spicy, but it can be. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy mine spicy. So yeah. Nice. Okay. My mouth is watering now and this will lead (laughs) us into your asking about your, your book. So you were saying your grandmother was cooking for you for the family. Yeah. So then we would, my sister and I would eat that after school and then maybe have a snack later on. And my parents would eat separately when they would get in because my mother would arrive home first. My father would arrive home a little bit later in the evening. And yeah, you just ate when you got home. That that was the way we interacted around dinner time. So when I had my own family I wanted it to be different because I wanted to have those conversations with everybody present. Yeah. What event in your life has had the most profound impact on you? My mother's cancer diagnosis. Mm-hmm. I would say that was the first big one. Yeah. Yeah. I was a medical student, third year. I was... <laughs> Ironically, in my ob rotation at the very hospital where my mother came to have the biopsy done, Mm -hmm. she knew the surgeon, he was a family friend, and I was in the adjacent OR helping with a vaginal hysterectomy. When the surgeon took the biopsy, sent it to pathology, received the results, I just remember very clearly he came up behind me and very gently whispered, it's malignant. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a hell of a way to find out. Yeah. Needless to say, I I couldn't finish assisting. I asked if please I could be excused because I wanted to go tell my dad. And I remember just 
I was crying and I was trying to race to my dad in the waiting room. And the two nurses outside of the OR who were at the desk calmed me down and said, you can't go tell him like this. So they really helped me. And then from there, we started dealing with my mother's cancer. It was terrible. Stage 3B. It was bad. Mm -hmm. Now, did she survive? Oh, yes. She is a 20 plus year survivor. Because at that time, she went for a study at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they were able to give her a harsh treatment of chemotherapy and radiation and bone marrow transplant. So my Mm. mom's been through it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we went through it together. Did that influence your choice of specialization? No, I was already going to, I was thinking about becoming a pathologist anyway, and I was just trying to go through my rotations with an open mind. And I did like ob but I didn't like the lifestyle that would have accompanied ob because it was very important to me. I always knew I wanted to do two things, be a doctor and be uh, a family person, mother, wife. Mm-hmm. And both were very, very important to me. So I chose pathology because I was able to attend a pathology rotation and see all of these women in the department who were killing it professionally and still had these wonderful thriving families. Right. So that was one of the main reasons I picked pathology. So you're living the dream. You become a pathologist. You're a mother wife, you've got a career, you've got a job. What what happened? When you described in the introduction earlier, I had this desire, this dream to become a doctor, and then it was not what I thought it was that was spot on. Because when I was training in pathology, it was a five-year residency. This was after a four-year medical school stint, five years of residency, plus an additional year of specialization I did. I really liked what I was seeing generally because, again, there seemed to be a work-life balance. It fit my personality, that being one of needing time and wanting to really think and study and investigate and put a story together based on what I was seeing in the operating room and on the slide and listening to the patient's story or reading the patient's story, asking the patient's doctor questions to get more clarification. It felt also very collaborative. It was Mm. very collaborative. That's what I liked about pathology too. It wasn't just collaborative with the patient's doctor. It was collaborative with each other. People buzzing around in the department, showing each other interesting cases. I'm stumped by this. Or, oh, I'm really excited by this. Look at this thing. And I thought I could really thrive in that type of environment. Don't get me wrong. It was very hard, of course. It's the final diagnosis, the diagnosis you need to give to an oncologist or an internist or a radiologist so that they know what to do next for the patient. But I just really liked, again, that we had time to think. I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I didn't like feeling panicked in the OR or feeling panicked in the ER or running around because a baby is is almost due. And I I just didn't like that energy. I don't thrive that way. Mm. And then when I started to practice, not only was it not delivering on the promise of how I had trained because the business was starting to shift, or I should say it was becoming more of a business in the practice setting where I was, where it started to become how many, how much, how fast. And I'm like, well, wait, wait a minute. My parents worked in a factory. Now I'm a factory worker. That's how Mm -hmm. it felt. Mm -hmm. But getting paid a lot more. I wasn't proud of myself. It didn't match. I didn't feel like 
but I was attending to my integrity. Hmm. I felt like a whore where I was selling my services and I felt very soulless doing it. That's what practicing felt like to me at one point. Not that I want to apologize because this is my experience. I don't want to make it seem like the medical profession is just a terrible thing. I'm the one who did it. I'm the one who invested the time. I'm the one who invested the money. So I think it it was okay for me to make the decision that is, it was essentially not something that I could sustain. It was not sustainable for me. It -hmm. just was not. And it was affecting my health. And yet, look at the sunk costs, the Mm -hmm. investment of time and energy, money, years of your life that you had dedicated to your profession and somebody in your in your family says i want to become a doctor and it's like hallelujah somebody's <laughs> entering into one of the professions right i mean it then suddenly you're faced with i'm no longer going to do that what did that look like so it, it it came to a head because my body could not sustain what i was trying to push it to do. My mental health was suffering. I was depressed. I didn't want to recognize that. My husband and my internal medicine doctor helped me. They had to because I couldn't save myself at that point. And so after I received the diagnosis of major clinical depression, I had to do something different. And I had to face during my therapy and healing after that that at the end of the day, I just didn't like what I was doing. And I was only 40. So my heroes who had retired in pathology, I I saw so many retirement parties, people turning, you know, 70, 75, still able to practice pathology, still sharp, still loving it. It just wasn't my fate. I wasn't happy like that. And there were other clues I was ignoring. I had a colleague who, even though we were so busy and the workload was getting more and more and more oppressive, I still saw joy with him. Mm. He would have, he would still find those cases and have genuine excitement about a diagnosis or a finding that was super interesting. It was not an act. And when I would see that, I would say to myself, what is wrong with me? Mm. Why don't I feel that joy, that real joy, that inside out joy versus the, I accomplished something, good girl, pat on the back. I made it, good girl, pat on the back. Because see, Linda, something to understand too is not that my parents raised me this way, they didn't, but at the same time, it's not like we talked about the concept of joy. I mean, they left their country, they had to for opportunity. So of course it was going to be, love your family, education is important, schools, you know, find something that you like, they didn't assign professions to us, but be educated so that you could have more opportunities for yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, and and we saw the sacrifices they were making. So it's not like I exactly grew up with this specifically expressed, like what you do, love what you do. We didn't talk like that. So I went through school thinking, oh, I guess I'm supposed to be miserable. Because anything worth having requires a lot of pain, blood. I remember when I got my my diploma from the University of Chicago, I graduated with honors and I had it framed and I was so proud of it. But you know what I wanted to decorate it with? Droplets of my blood Mm. on the glass. Hmm. That's how I was existing. Like, oh, life is supposed to be painful. This is supposed to be bad. But when I arrive, when I finally arrive, maybe this suffering will stop. And it didn't. Wow. 
What does living a courageous life mean to you? Standing up for yourself, listening to yourself, being responsible for yourself, being responsible for your life. It is yours. That is one thing I definitely was extremely impressed by in practicing pathology, in being in medicine for as long as I was. Your life is not a given. You'd never know what's going to happen. My mother was only 45, Mm. 45, when she had this terrible diagnosis. No family history, not an unhealthy person. It almost came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. We, We were all just stunned. We were looking around like, what maternal person or what what on the paternal side where no one had cancer like this before her so being courageous to me means recognizing and not living in fear i'm not saying to live in fear or dread but recognizing that you get this shot and so what are you going to do with this shot living through this time of pandemic if one of the lessons isn't to not take for granted your brief time. There are plenty of people in the before times and even now where suddenly out of left field, you get this diagnosis and in four days you're dead. I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. bizarre. Mm -hmm. And yet that's exactly what has been happening through this COVID time where somebody suddenly gets sick and gets really sick and is gone. But to me, if there's some sort of higher power that's trying to send us a message, that's got to be at least one of them. And, and certainly people in the medical community see this all the time. Hmm. All the time. Mm-hmm. What seems like a perfectly healthy person comes in and mm-hmm. this is discovered and there's kind of nothing to be done except make them comfortable. I just found out that a beloved yoga teacher who was one of the healthiest people I had ever seen was doing everything, quote unquote, right. She had pancreatic cancer. Mm. She did not survive. Wow. I'm sorry to hear that. So I, again, I, I don't say that we should live in fear and be thinking about our mortality 24-7. That's not what I'm saying. But I really love that that's one of one of my favorite books, as you know, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Begin with the End in Mind. That is my favorite habit because... It just keeps you humble and present. I don't want to waste this time. I don't want to not do this thing because I'm holding myself back because I'm too afraid. I want to make the most impact and be proud of myself and feel like I'm behaving from inside out, that I'm honoring my values and that the people around me are proud of. And I feel joy. I feel I'm busy, but I feel joy in what I'm doing and producing. It's just a very different, it's a very different me I am right now than I was 10 years ago. 100%. I can only imagine. I felt at the time that I you know, went through this big change that I was attending a funeral. Like I was being eulogized as I was leaving Mm. the business. And so for me on a certain level, that person died. Mm -hmm. There are certainly glimpses of that person at times and didn't truly die, but there are elements of me that I hope never come back. I mean, I, I do not wish to resuscitate any of those aspects of myself. The quote, begin with the end in mind. This ties in, in my mind, to what's your legacy and how are you living that legacy? So my legacy is serving my community, serving, empowering, educating people who may not believe in their capabilities. It is expanding the idea of what it means to be healthy. Because when I was at my lowest point, I was externally pretty healthy because I'd been working out so much and dieting and all that. And I looked good on the outside. And like you 
referred to in the beginning of the interview, everything looked great. Thriving kids, great husband, parents, you know, sis. And so it, everything looked great, but I was dying inside. Mm. So really attending to our health in, in so many dimensions is a simple concept, not so simple to implement, but simple to think about decluttering, decluttering your life in terms of your social circle. How do you surround yourself? Are they uplifting you or are they clutter? Are they toxic? One of the reasons I'm this best version of myself right now is because of the people with whom I choose to surround myself. A Kimbo land, certain family members, certain friends. I'm very careful about selecting at this point because I want people around me to uplift me and to challenge me to be my best self. So that's another part of my legacy is expanding the idea of being healthy. I want to be remembered for being a loyal, loving, reliable, responsible, empathetic family member as well. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm an aunt. I take all those things very seriously. What would you do on your last day? It's a hard question. I'd want to be surrounded by people I love in a spacious, beautiful setting with music. And I was just talking to my daughter about this last meal. I'm I'm turning 50 at the end of this month, and I was on a call with my mother and father. And my mom said, well, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, oh, well, you know my favorite Haitian staples. So I listed them. And my daughter was on the FaceTime call too. And I said, I'm just telling you, these are my last meals. Back to my childhood, the food that I had then that made me feel nurtured and loved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a beautiful segue to talking about the project that you're working on now, which is a combination of memoir, wise women tribute, tribute to the wise women in your own family, Mm -hmm. to music, to your culture. Tell me a little bit more about that. I have finally found the courage to identify (laughs) myself. (laughs) Because I resisted this for a long time. I've been talking about this cookbook for years, but identifying myself as a writer, I just don't have the book in my hand just yet, but I'm a writer. I'll, I'll get there being an author because I, I can see it. It's a cookbook that is going to honor my maternal great-grandmother, grandmother, and mother. We're going to record... Haitian recipes. We're going to write stories, memories about those recipes, family memories, personal times, loving times. Cooking was my grandmother's love language. She didn't tell us, I love you. She showed it to us by sacrificing her life and and leaving Haiti and coming and taking care of us until she died. So I want to make this a tribute. I want it to have joy. I want it to have color. I love Haitian art. I have Mm. Haitian art in my home. And so I can already see that I don't just want photography. I want illustrated imagery of my, my maternal matriarchs and the food that we grew up with. And I want it to bring vibrancy and energy to the stories that we tell around this food. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my first book. I don't have the title yet, but I can see it. I've had the privilege of reading some of the passages and some of the Haitian art that you've, that you've shared in your posts. And once again, every time I read (laughs) you describing the food and the chicken and the rice (laughs) and the, and it's just like, Oh my, I have to come for <laughs> I have to come by for dinner. 
<laughs> You'd like, be most welcome. Oh, I'm <laughs> salivating. Oh my goodness. If you had the opportunity to have a conversation for five minutes with someone living or dead, who would that be? I would want to talk to my grandmother because I've been thinking about her so much, as you mentioned, with my writing. And it's been very surprising to me. And by the way, thank you for your support, because Mm -hmm. this mining of memories and emotions has definitely brought up a lot of stuff. (laughs) Mm. And I was starting to feel this immense resistance. And you sent me this lovely supporting note. So don't underestimate Mm. the positive impact that you've had in my journey as well. Thank you for the support. You're welcome. It's, I've been thinking a lot about my grandmother and wishing that I could talk to her now with my nearly 50-year-old eyes and experience to learn more about her. Mm. It's interesting to think about your grandmother, your mother, at the times in your life that you are now, you know, at mm-hmm. various times where you're like, you're at 40 and you're struggling with X and just sort of trying to piece together what your parents or grandparents' lives were like. And Mm -hmm. it's just the struggle that they would have gone through in leaving Haiti and coming to America and trying to make a go of it and all that no doubt was, was in front of them and creating a life and creating this beautiful family that has now put down roots and had such a positive impact on their new country. And yet being able to reach back into their cultural roots and bring that forward and create it anew for your daughters and for your family is just a beautiful thing. Love it. Thank you. It's another way that I'm using to get to know about my family, to get to know what they went through, to really appreciate, not just in words, what they went through, but to really, really appreciate with this experience the idea of leaving everything you knew behind. A few years ago, so it would have been teen, 2015, my sisters and I went with my dad to Haiti. We hadn't Mm. been back. Well, we had never really visited. I was just a baby when I went to Haiti. So it was life-changing because I got to know my dad differently. Hearing stories seeing the places, uh, appreciating these anecdotes where he's a kid and all of the walking he did because they were poor. So he did a lot of walking. And so now it makes a lot of sense. My dad walks two to three hours a day now. So it makes a ton of that connection, that small thing. I just felt like I got to know him better. And I want to get to know my family better by writing this book too. Mm-hmm. And putting putting it down historically and proudly because another one, another influence to writing this book is Henry Louis Gates' work, Finding Your Roots. I always find the programming fascinating. I love watching people being surprised by what their ancestors did and what they went through. But I always found it tragic that most of the time the African-American experience was so different. No records, no ability to reach back. And in a lot of ways, our family's like that too. No ability to reach back too far. So I don't want to lose what we can still think about and talk about. My mother still can represent my maternal grandmother and my grandmother. The story still lives in us and I, I want it to be tangible. I see you looking down and seeing that book. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about your beautiful yogic life that you've found and embraced and created. And it's so amazing. You have this incredible podcast. Your voice is so soothing. I remember someone that interviewed you, just like, you have the most beautiful voice, just listening to you. And having had the opportunity to experience your 
your teaching is just so beautiful. And hearing you in some of your other interviews describing how you use basically whatever your student needs, you mm -hmm. adapt beautifully to whether it's the chair or water or the floor. So it was a beautiful marriage for me of no sunk costs. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be this person without that experience. I don't have any regrets. And so with that experience, I've taken it into this new way of being a doctor. Finally, the doctor I envisioned. There's the integrity now. There's the pride in my work because I'm able to take my knowledge and apply it in yoga for bodies that are not your stereotypical yoga bodies. Mm -hmm. So yoga is not about your handstands. It's not about turning yourself into a pretzel. It's more about how you treat yourself, how you treat others, how you take care of yourself physically, how you take care of yourself mentally, emotionally, how you breathe. Meditation is part of yoga, all of those mm -hmm. things. And so I'm able to do this work that I love organically with matriarchs, women. It was a natural attraction. It just became the wise women who kept coming back to class and, and, and building this sense of community and being able to be together and modify poses to fit their bodies and not vice versa, to focus on what does it really mean to breathe well? How does that benefit you? What does it mean to truly relax? Because most people don't know how to relax. We think we do, but consciously relaxing is, a, is an art. It's a practice. So all of those things are, are the reasons why I love teaching the population that I do and that I am, well, here's another thing. So I just taught a class this morning. Mm -hmm. And when I used to end my work day at the hospital, and I did used to refer to it as the penitentiary out loud to my family <laughs> members. So when I would be done with the day there, I felt like I had survived wartime, Okay. I've been through it. I was a soldier and I could do it. Yeah, I felt like a soldier. Now, when I get off of my hour teaching sessions with my yoga students, I feel energized. I feel mm. happy. I'm not depleted. So those are the reasons why I love teaching yoga to my population and just making the little things too. The little things bring me so much profound happiness, getting a note from a student who says, before I started taking yoga with you, I couldn't climb into my bathtub unassisted. And the other day, because of what we were learning, strength and confidence, getting up and out of a chair, I was able to get in and out of my bathtub with confidence without any help for the first time. Wow. Wow. So it's the it's two ways. It's a relationship. There's so much gratitude for each other. I feel connection. I feel that collaboration I, I've wanted all those years ago. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up? The way you talk to yourself matters. Being kind to yourself sounds simple. But it is a practice, and we're worth showing ourselves that kindness. And how did you come to that realization? After years and years of healing, after I left that job, after I left that life, that I mm. didn't miss for a single day after I left it. That's telling, too. And then finally getting to do the work that I was meant to do, be the person that I'm meant to be. And I realized I was missing that ingredient, that vital ingredient, self-compassion, kindness. Mm. I didn't want to model that for my kids either. 
I mm. was unintentionally doing so, but unintentionally modeling grit and determination and focusing on the external rewards and success that you could show to people to prove your worth versus what I'm modeling now, which is the care, the joy, the excitement. You know, I can't finish a podcast episode or do a class or share a funny story or something that made me laugh. I can't get to my girls fast enough to tell them, you know what happened today? And they see the the excitement when I'm mm-hmm. talking about my work. I finally have that joy, that attending that I used to envy in that fellow practitioner I worked with. I have it now. Benefiting and serving others. Finally, the doctor I've always wanted to be. Do you have any questions for me or something I've asked you, something else you'd like to ask? What is a way, if you had to pick one way, that you show yourself sustainable kindness? Staying sober. That's beautiful. Staying sober because everything else falls apart or falls away really the minute that I'm not. Mm. As hard as the days are, as hard as it is sometimes for a whole variety of reasons, everything would be different again. Not in, not in a good way, I don't think. So. so I would love to finish this up with a minute or so of just experiencing a Nadine closure. It would be my pleasure. Okay. When you need a little bit of energy, when you need a little bit of even calming and just a minute to stop, it's super important to breathe and notice. It's super important to let go of judgment. This is how you start to show yourself compassion. You are not your thoughts and you are not your emotions. Can you compassionately observe those thoughts and and maybe learn what they're telling you or recognize how they might not be serving you any longer? So we'll do that by sitting up nice and tall in our chairs, planting our feet such that our knees are stacked over our ankles and our toes point forward, stack our shoulders over our hips, lengthen our necks, keeping the shoulders away from the ears. The top of your head is touching the ceiling and your chin is parallel to your lap. Your hands can rest softly in your lap. I'm a visual person, so picture a teardrop-shaped balloon. The bottom of the balloon is wide and it expands around your abdomen, makes its way around your rib cage, and ties between your collarbones. So as you inhale, fill the balloon, breathing in and out through your nose, from your belly all the way up to your collarbones. And when you're ready to deflate the balloon, you exhale, untying the balloon between the collarbones, down your chest, and drawing your navel gently into your spine at the end of your exhale. The breath is continuous, deep, slow, soundless. And as you settle into your breath, this is where you can observe without judgment physical sensations, your energy, your thoughts. This is an exercise that can be done anytime, eyes open or closed in a quiet place. And once you practice this enough, you can start to use this same compassionate observation when you need it in stressful situations. And when you're ready to open your eyes and come back to the present, (laughs) 
No, don't make me come back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. What a beautiful Thank way to you. finish this conversation. And I am so grateful for your presence on this earth, your presence in my life. And I look forward to a long relationship as we continue to discover what the next stages of our lives are. Thank you, Linda. I feel the same way. You're just damn good people. So thank you for being a part of my life, too. <laughs> and I'm going to make you cook me dinner for sure. <laughs> if you're going to torture me with those descriptions of your food, it's like, okay, as soon as the border comes open, I'm going to come down and visit. <laughs> you're more than welcome. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much. This was great. I think about that line of wise and courageous women from which Nadine comes. And I look forward to having that dinner one day with them and enjoying some recipes from her soon-to-be cookbook. I will share her social media links in the show notes, including her wonderful Yogi MD podcast. Thank you for listening. Please follow or subscribe to this podcast. And if you feel someone else might benefit from listening to this episode, please share it leave a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I appreciate you listening very much and providing this feedback. I'm already working on season four, and I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to reach out to me via my website, www.thearena-podcast.com, or any of my social channels. I look forward to sharing my next guest story of the focused fight to hold herself and her family together through her son's multiple cancer diagnoses and treatments. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in The Arena. <laughs>